So our next presenter has been described by Barbara Marks Hubbard as, quote, one of the leading thinkers of our age. The, uh, the prestigious publication New Scientist asks the question, what great physicist hides behind the mask of Wilson? Old friend and popular author Tom Robbins says that Robert Anton Wilson is a dazzling barker hawking tickets to the most thrilling tilt-a-whirls and daring lupo planes on the midway of higher consciousness. And the LA Times says that he is hilarious and multidimensional. Publishers Weekly says that he is erudite, witty, and genuinely scary. <laughs> Considered to be one of the most important scientific philosophers of this century, Robert Anton Wilson sees himself as a futurist, author, former stand-up comic, now sit-down comic. Let's give a warm welcome to Robert Anton Wilson. Could we have the lights on? I like to see who I'm talking to. Just like Gene Houston. Hey, that's much better. Nice to see who's here. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was in the middle of lunch. I didn't realize how soon I was supposed to go on. And suddenly they came and yanked me and dragged me up here. Let's see, where do I start? My topic today is the universe contains a maybe. And that should be obvious to everybody because we've got a new president, maybe. The, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, four to five to four, I almost said four to five. Uh, maybe that's prejudice creeping out. Five to four, the Supreme Court has ruled that George Bush won the election and we can't do any more counting, not officially. But the Miami Herald is doing their own count, which is legal under the Florida law. So by the time Bush gets to the White House, we may know officially that Gore actually carried the state, which... <laughs> well, I don't give a damn, actually. <clears throat> well, all I know for sure is that my candidate won. My candidate was nobody, as has been the case ever since the middle of the 1960s. No, nobody got 52% of the vote. That is to say, 52% of the potential voters didn't even bother going to the polls. I understand why. I don't like to go to the polls either. It makes me feel like I've been to some kind of cesspool or some kind of really filthy brothel in an Arab country. <laughs> And I, I avoid them like the plague. So I, I, I always vote for nobody. And this time, nobody got 52% of the vote. That is, most people didn't have the same feeling as me. They didn't want to go to those loathsome places with those crooked machines. And so nobody got more votes than Bush and Gore added together. As a matter of fact, if you count all the votes for the minority candidates, such as Brown and Buchanan and what's the other guy's name? Oh, Nader, yeah. And uh, there's a, about five others in various states. If you, they got about 5% of the vote. So you add that on to the 52% who voted for nobody. It's, uh, when people vote for a minority candidate, that's equivalent to voting for nobody. It's a way of expressing contempt for the system actively by going there and actually writing something in or if they got a ballot, you mark it. And if you mark it for Buchanan, it will count for Bush, at, at, least, at, least, at least in Florida. There's a, new, there's a new bumper sticker all around Palm Beach County. It says, Jews for Buchanan, <laughs> which is almost as funny and terrifying as Jews for Hitler, you know. But, but a lot of them did apparently vote for Buchanan. That's the butterfly ballot. You've all heard of the butterfly effect in Discordian Math 101. 
otherwise known as chaos mathematics. Chaos mathematics has been developed into so many sciences, I can't even name half of them. But it started in the field of meteorology, a mathematician who decided to make his living as a weather forecaster or a meteorologist discovered that one of the most brilliant minds of the 20th century, John von Neumann, was working at predicting weather with computers. Von Neumann, I have always considered the man who prevented World War III. First of all, he invented the mathematical theory of games, and then he proved the mathematical theory of games could be, could be applied to business competition, and then he proved it could be comply, applied to war. By then he got interested in, he got lost interest in game theory and got interested in computers, and John von Neumann designed the first programmable computer. Before von Neumann, they used to put a computer together to do a particular problem and then take it apart when they want to do another problem and put it together. He invented the distinction between hardware and software. So between the invention of war game theory and programmable computers, he gave us a world in which the two superpowers of the time, the Soviet Union and the disunited states, were solving all, or were calculating their odds of winning a war against each other with nuclear weapons using John von Neumann's computers and his game theory. And every time they come up with a great plan to wipe the Soviet Union off the face of the earth, the computers would come back with the answer, you get wiped out too. So back to the drawing board, they had to start over. And this went on for about 40 years until both sides were bankrupt and they called off the Cold War. Well, actually, the real reason they called off the Cold War is they discovered the Swiss owned the whole planet anyway. Uh, Harold Wilson, no relative, I swear to God. Harold, Harold Wilson said Europe is controlled by the Gnomes of Zurich. As far as I know, he's the only one who ever pronounced the G in that word. He always found gno the Gnomes of Zurich, by which he meant the big Swiss banks. The big Swiss banks owned the big English and American banks, which owned the English and American governments, which owned most of the rest of the planet. And the Gnomes of Zurich owned everything, so what the hell was the point of the United States and Russia fighting over mere territory? So the Cold War came to an end, and then they started to look for new villains. They've tried out Satanists and child molesters, pornographers, and, uh, and people who use medical marijuana to treat their pains or nausea. They haven't found a good new villain, but they're still building more bombs anyway in case they do find a new villain. Uh, both Bush and Gore, I call them Gush and Boar because I can't tell the difference. Both of them, they, they did, you know, you notice this was the first election in which the candidates didn't disagree about anything. <laughs> but they did, a, one of the many things they agreed on is we need a stronger military to defend us against our enemies. What the fuck is the matter with these people? <laughs> If the United States government stopped messing around with the governments and the people of all the rest of the world, if we weren't bombing Kuwait one day and Kosovo the next day and Sudan the next day and another place the next day, if we didn't have our CIA in there manipulating their elections, nobody would have any grudge against the United States. We wouldn't have the World Trade Center being blown up. We wouldn't have the constant threat of terrorism. But they don't want to give up bombing places, so all they can do is build a national security state in which they spy on all of us more and more with satellites and all sorts of modern technology uh, because we need national security. It never, never occurs to them we wouldn't need national security if we weren't the major enemy to most of the people in the world. <clears throat> I mean, to the... To the do the people in Amsterdam worry about terrorists setting off bombs there? No, because Amsterdam and Nederland in general is not trying to dominate the whole world. As long as the United States government is trying to dominate the whole world, we'll be threatened by terrorism. As long as we're threatened by terrorism, 
they're going to need more and more security, surveillance, and we're all going to be spied on more and more, which suits them fine because they don't trust us at all. What do you think the piss police are all about? They, they know, you know, the, I calculated about 10 years ago, I don't know if the proportion has changed, but I doubt it, there is one cop to every 400 citizens in this country. How can one cop make sure what 400 people are doing in the privacy of their own living rooms, bathrooms, or bedrooms? The war against some people who use some drugs, which they abbreviate generally to the war against drugs, but it's actually a war against some people who use some drugs. The only way they could turn it into a real war on drugs is if the government was taken over by Christian scientists. <laughs> the Christian scientists are the only people in the country who have an absolutely sincere and Gandhian war on drugs. They're totally nonviolent against it. They just refuse to take drugs themselves, any kind of drugs. About eight of them are in prison, the last I heard, for refusing to take drugs. So when you hear about a war on drugs, always correct it to a war on some drugs. They're not warring on all drugs. They're only warring on the drugs that are not controlled by the big major pharmaceutical companies who uh, each uh, who collectively donated $34 million to both Gush and Bohr. Which is why I can't get very excited about which one of those two lying bastards won. <laughs> you know, they both represent the same interests. Well, anyway, right now, George Bush is our president, maybe. But the thing, the contest, everybody said it ended when the Supreme Court came down with their five to four division along with the party lines that everybody predicted they would come vote on. But it's not over yet because the votes haven't been counted. And under Florida law, the votes are accessible to anybody who wants to count them. The Miami Herald is counting them right now. The NAACP and the ACLU have both so shown some interest in doing their own counts, although they haven't passed a resolution yet to do it. But we're going to get other counts and I kind of suspect Al Gore will win. Not that I like Al Gore all that much, but I figure the way he was fighting so hard for a recount, his advisors, his whole staff, they must have had good reasons to think he was going to win if there was a full recount. Now, when you consider how hard and how desperate and how ferocious the Bush attempt was to prevent a recount, I think they thought Al Gore was going to win too. So when you find the two experts, the two leading experts on how to manipulate the general public, which is the art known as politics, when they both think Gore probably won, I think, well, maybe he did win. So what's going to happen when the Miami Herald comes out announcing that George Bush did carry Florida? I think impeachment proceedings will start the next day because a lot of the Democratic Party is still very pissed off. So George Bush is our president, maybe. And, I, and I, I'm used to that. I'm used to thinking in maybes. And, uh, you know, following Gene Houston is a hard act. <laughs> I never had all of her show business training and so on, but I, howsoever, I have studied neuro-linguistic programming a bit. And so I will ask you, <clears throat> pardon me, I had a Manhattan with my lunch. <laughs> have, you, uh, have you had a Manhattan at the restaurant here? Boy, that's a big bastard. <laughs> I forgot what I was going to ask you. <laughs> oh, well. You know, I, I, I don't need Manhattans, really. I have found a way to get high and stay spaced out for hours on end, and the government can't take it away from me. It's called senility. <laughs> there, are, there, there are four major 
symptoms that you can recognize your own senility. The first is increase in long-term memory. <laughs> I, I can go to the kitchen to get something, and on the way to the kitchen, I remember a kid named Billy Batson <laughs> with whom I had a fist fight in first grade of Resurrection Grammar School in Brooklyn, New York in 1938. I can remember what he looked like. I can even remember the name of the nun who came running out and broke up the fist fight when we both had bloody noses already. I remember we both had bloody noses. That cheered me up tremendously because if I was the only one with the bloody nose, I would have been the loser. I can remember all that. Uh, I, I can remember, I had ancestors I can remember. Some of them, some of them looked more like healer monsters than anything else. Most of us know we're related to the primates, but when you get onto really heavy drugs or senility or something like that, you can remember back to the Gila monster and the, the, the banana slug and our other less attractive ancestors. And the second effect of senility is that when I get to the kitchen, I can't remember what the fuck I went there for. <laughs> and, the third, and the third effect I don't remember what the third effect is, but the fourth effect is, I don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> However, there was a friend of mine who tell, uh, swears to God that he swears by all the gods that writers believe in, and most writers don't believe in any god except their own creative unconscious. But he swears he was in Philadelphia when Eleanor Roosevelt introduced Marian Anderson at a concert, and while Eleanor, most of you are too young to even remember Eleanor Roosevelt, she was sort of like uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton to the nth degree. She was the most controversial first lady we ever had. By the way, talking about Hillary Rodham Clinton, do you ever notice if you say her name five times fast, it sounds like a train going over a bridge? Hillary Rodham Clinton, Hillary Rodham Clinton, Hillary Rodham Clinton, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Hillary. It sounds like the bridge is even shaking a little. But, but getting back to Eleanor, she was introducing, <laughs> she was introducing Marian Anderson when somebody in the audience, some low-brow, right-wing, fascist, Ku Klux motherfucker, <laughs> crept into the audience. Marian Anderson was Afro-American, in case you don't remember. She was banned from singing in the Constitution Hall by the, D the Daughters of the American Revolution, which was kind of weird because the Daughters of the American Revolution should be mostly black since the first one killed in the American Revolution was black. Crispus Atter killed in the Boston Massacre. But be that as it may, the Daughters of the Revolution, for some strange reason, are all white. And they didn't like Marian Anderson singing in their hall, but she was singing a few months later in Philadelphia. And this friend of mine went there, and Eleanor was introducing her when some loud-mouthed Ku Klux motherfucker, as I said, some redneck son of a bitch cocksucker, I mean, you know, you know the type. They all drive taxi cabs in New York. You, can, you can't get a ride, you can't take a taxi cab in New York without getting one, racism 101 plus ethno ethno prejudice 102 and all the rest of it. You know, you know those guys. He suddenly yells out, "Marion Anderson sucks cock!" And there was a deathly silence fell over them. Everybody was so nobody knew what to do about this character. And Eleanor leaned forward to the microphone and said, nonetheless, <laughs> and, went <on. laughs> and went on with her talk. <laughs> now that's, that's the way Hillary should have handled all, all of Bill's extracurricular <laughs> activity. <laughs> nonetheless, I personally think Bill Clinton is going to live longer than any American president in legend, not only in history, but in legend and folklore. He's going, you know, Bill and Monica, it's going to be like Charles II and Nell Gwynn, Louis XIV and Madame Pompadour. I mean, the fabulous rulers and the fabulous courtesans, they, they go on forever. People, 
Well, who knows anything about the politics of Louis the Fourteenth? Nobody. Who knows anything about the politics of Charles the Second? Nobody. We know about their mistresses, though, because that's what lives in folk memory. And I swear, 5,000 years from now, they are still going to be talking about Bill and Monica, the first president who had a perpetual hard on. I mean, there, there'll be archaeologists, they'll be digging up these ithy phallic statues and arguing whether this is Pan or Priapus or Hermes or Bill Clinton. <laughs> Which brings me to July 23rd, 1973, a day that will live in something or other. I don't know if it will live in fame or infamy or notoriety or what, but two important things happened on July 23rd, 1973. The first one was that Monica Lewinsky was born. Now, like I said, she's going to live as long as Nell Gwynn and Madame Pompadour. The second thing that happened on July 23rd, 1973, is I became convinced I was receiving telepathic instruction on consciousness expansion from somebody in the system of the double star Sirius. How I got that opinion was I did LSD the night before. <laughs> And, and when I was peeking, I did the invocation of the Holy Guardian Angel from the Book of Abramelin the Mage, which is an ancient Kabbalistic document about how to contact what Gene Houston calls the Entelechy. Uh, I call, well, anyway, I have all sorts of names for it. I, I did this ritual on acid, and I got an answer. I was being instructed by a superior intelligence. So I went around for a year and a half getting more and more messages from Sirius, and then I met Jacques Vallée, one of the most original and innovative and unconventional students of the UFO phenomenon, and somebody's taking my picture. Somebody's always taking my picture. I feel like Marilyn Monroe. So somebody said the two most photographed objects of the 20th century were Niagara Falls and Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> I've never had a calendar with, Niagara, with 12 pictures of Niagara Falls on it, but every year I get a calendar with 12 pictures of Marilyn Monroe on it. It shows I appreciate natural wonders, but I have my own standards about what really constitutes a natural wonder. Anyway, when I met Jacques Vallée, I, t I talked about my experiences, and he said extraterrestrials are just the modern model for it. It fits into the modern paradigm. In the 19th century, they thought it was dead relatives communicating through spiritualist mediums. In the earlier ages, they thought it was either angels or demons. And he went on with that about how this has been going on all through history. And he convinced me, yeah, it has all sorts of different for forms that it takes. So I wasn't so sure it was extraterrestrials from Sirius. I decided maybe it was a bunch of Sufis somewhere in Afghanistan who have this, what the Sufis call a powerhouse, and they're sending out transmissions all the time to people who are ready to get turned on. And then I got an assignment. I worked part-time as a journalist because nobody makes a living as a novelist these days. You've got to have 10 different occupations to support your novel writing habit. I've got several, including appearing at the festivals like this and fucking everybody's head over. And uh, I should have. I don't think I should have had that Manhattan with lunch. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding you. I'm putting you on. I know what I'm doing all the time, even if you don't. <laughs> I went to an occult convention, and I had psychic readings by two highly renowned psychics, one of whom had the wonderful name Penny Looney. And that seemed such a wonderful name for a professional psychic that I entirely forgot the name of the other one by now. But Penny Looney told me a lot of things that were true, a lot of things that weren't true. And then she said, you're a channel. 
I never thought of myself as a channel, but yeah, that might be something. That's another metaphor for what's going on. I said, who am I channeling? She said, you're channeling an ancient Chinese Taoist alchemist. Well, I've been interested in Taoism for a long time. Maybe that was the first symptoms of this ancient Chinese Taoist alchemist getting in touch with me. And I've been studying alchemy off and on ever since I read Carl Jung's book on alchemy, and I read Alistair Crowley's entirely different interpretation of alchemy, which relates it directly to tantric yoga. Okay, a Chinese alchemist wants to communicate through me, with me, or through me. Okay, so it's not extraterrestrials from Sirius after all. Then I got another psychic reading, and this guy also told me I'm channeling something somebody or something. I said, what, what am I channeling? He said, it seems to be a medieval Irish bard named O'Loughlin. <laughs> I've been studying ancient medieval Irish bards ever since then. I have yet to find one named O'Loughlin. But oddly enough, my grandmother was named O'Loughlin, my grandmother on my father's side of the family. O'Loughlin means son of the Dane which means that I must be remotely related to Hamlet, who was also a son of a Dane, I guess. So then I had the puzzle. Whatever is happening to me, is it coming from Sirius, from a Sufi powerhouse in Afghanistan, from an ancient Chinese alchemist, or from a medieval Irish bard? The universe contains many maybes. The, I gave this talk the wrong title, The Universe Contains a Maybe. I got that from David Finkelstein, one of the leading quantum physicists in America today. But the universe doesn't contain a maybe, it contains endless maybes. Well, while I was puzzling over where the hell I'm getting all this weird information and visualization and uh, inhuman experiences, I happened to look at a movie called Harvey, which was a su big successful play on Broadway, and I was living in New York at that time, but somehow I never got to see it. It was a big successful movie, and somehow I never got to see it. It's like I wasn't ready for it yet. Like the, f the Cosmic Coincidence Control Center, CCCC, invented and patented in all nations by John Lilly. Cosmic Coincidence Control Center wanted to make sure I was ready for Harvey when I saw it. Harvey is about a chap named Elwood P. Dowd who has an ally named Harvey. Harvey is a six foot tall white rabbit that most people can't see. By and large, nobody can see Harvey except Elwood himself. Every now and then somebody else catches a glimpse of Harvey, but they're never quite sure of it. There's a cynic in the movie, a psychiatric orderly named Wilson. And that caught my attention. <laughs> because after all, Alan Wilson Watts was one of the people who opened me up to alternative ways of thinking. And Wilson has always been a very important name to me for that reason. And then I remembered, hey, that's my name too, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And so I was very, so I'm watching this movie with great curiosity, and Wilson in the movie is the one who's most skeptical about the existence of the six foot tall invisible white rabbit named Harvey. Then he finds out that Harvey is a puka. And I sat up straight. I knew a lot about pukas due to my study of Irish law. The puka is a, is a vegetation spirit or elf or something of that sort who mostly lives in County Kerry, although he's been known to move around Ireland and appear in other places. He generally hangs around pubs. Irish pubs close at 11.30. You can't get a drink after 11.30 unless you know the publican very well. And they know the cop on the beat is gonna come in and have his quarter to midnight drink too and won't bust anybody. But according to the law, they close at 11.30 and people start home. Now, Irish roads are like English roads. They weave and turn. They're not straight like American roads. That, some people say that's because the roads were made by the drunks staggering home from the pub at night. Actually, the Irish word for road is bohar, which means cow path. 
So it was the cows who originally created the roads and the drunks followed the cows, I guess. Anyway, if you're coming out of an Irish pub at 11.30 and you're on your way home, the puka may suddenly decide to descend upon you. Generally, he grabs you by the collar and yells, got your arse, mate, and drags you off into a parallel universe, just like you hear about in modern physics, or a set of parallel universes, and you meet all the great Irish heroes, Finn McCool, Cahoolan, Nile of the Nine, Hostages, Patrick Columbus, Brian Confucius, Luke Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Zeus, Apollo, the Davis, the Pans, the Satyrs. You have billions and billions of years of adventures and alternative realities. And when the puka gets through playing with you, he puts you back on the road. And it's only one minute after you left the pub in ordinary time. And so anyway, in the movie, uh, Wilson, the, order, the psychiatric orderly, looks up puka in the dictionary and he finds the definition. Puka, a Celtic alpha vegetation spirit, wise but mischievous, fond of rum pots, crack pots, and how are you tonight, Mr. Wilson? At which point he drops the dictionary and I sort of drop my bottom jaw. My God, now it's talking to me over the television. <laughs> Later, I moved to Ireland, and believe it or not, our writers are notorious for improving on stories, but I swear this really happened. I wonder if anybody believes me. My uh, first night in Ireland, my wife turned on her transistor radio to hear a real Irish radio show. And the first thing we got was a, an interviewer from Dublin who had what I later got to recognize as the Trinity College accent. That's the upper class Dublin accent. And introducing a farmer with a County Kerry accent who was telling him legends about the puka and people he knew who had encountered the puka. And these were pretty funny and pretty hilarious and very interesting. And finally, the, the educated Dublin man said to the Kerry man, but do you believe in the puka yourself? And the Kerry man said, that I do not. And I doubt much that he believes in me either. <laughs> and that was my first introdu introduction to Irish logic. <laughs> Irish facts have the plasticity of rubber inches. Irish logic has the structure of Zen Buddhism. William Butler Yeats said Ireland was part of Asia until the Battle of the Boyne. But that was just his basically romantic, reactionary attitude. Ireland is still part of Asia. If you don't believe me, get a copy of Finnegan's Wake. You will find that within Finnegan's Wake in chapter seven, you will find that a character named Shem the Penman, which is James the Penman, James Joyce, the author, is writing a book inside the book. And where is he writing it from? No number, Brimstone Walk, Asia in Ireland. Ireland is still part, yeah, ask for instructions in Dublin and Tokyo and you'll have exactly the same experience. They'll be very courteous, very helpful, and they'll send you in the wrong direction. Uh, the Irish and the Asians just do not have a grid similar to uh, the English and most of, uh, and the Americans and most of Western culture. Well, I decided to assume that whatever the hell was going on with me, I would describe it as adventures with my puka because it doesn't seem that it's very likely that anybody's going to take that metaphor literally. Whereas if I talked about extraterrestrials from Sirius or reincarnating Irish bards from the mid Middle Ages, some people might take that literally. But as long as I talk about the puka, everybody knows I'm talking in metaphors. And metaphors are all we've got. The, the universe contains many maybes. In 1933, uh, three tremendous events occurred. Alfred Korzybski published Science and Sanity, 
which argued that either or logic does not describe the world accurately and we needed a new non-Aristotelian orientation based on more than either or. Bush and Gore, either or. That's a terrible trap to be caught in. And Kozhybski suggested an infinite valued logic based on probabilities. And that's the way I've been thinking ever since I read Kozhybski. Some things I would, the things I'm most sure of, I give a 99% probability. I think I'm 99% sure I'm at the Prophets Conference in Palm Springs. I'm not 100% sure because I dreamed about it a few times before I came. For all I know, this is just another dream and I'm still home in Capitola just imagining I'm here. But I give that one a 99% probability because there are too many details that are too clear for a dream. But I won't give it a 100% probability because in my dreams I'm always sure they're real until I wake up. Now, the same year that Kozhybski published his probabilistic logic in, in a book called Science and Sanity, John von Neumann, anybody remember him? I was talking about him a little while ago. He designed the first programmable computer and invented mathematical game theory, which can be applied to poker, business, war, and a dozen other fields. He also suggested a, he suggested a three-valued logic, but he realized the Aristotelian two-valued logic wouldn't work. Not in the quant, this was on a book on quantum physics by von Neumann. He, instead of yes and no, he gave us three choices, yes, no, and maybe. And he represented yes by one, no by zero, and maybe by one half. And this is used by some physicists as the best way of dealing with quantum indeterminacy. The trouble with one half is that it assumes you can break things down into only three categories. I prefer Kozhybski's infinite valued logic. It depends on how much you know. Sometimes you can do much better than 1.5 and zero. Sometimes you can get to 0.75 or even to 0.99. Like, uh, for instance, Velikovsky's great comet theory, which was rejected, renounced, denounced, ostracized, banned, boycotted, etc., by the scientific community in the 1950s. I have never seen any reason to put that in a one or a zero. The whole scientific community put it in a zero. Velikovsky was a nut, and that's the end of it. They're still saying that. And he's got enough evidence to keep me interested. When I examine all of his evidence, is it enough to put me in one in certainty? Absolutely not. I think he proved there have been catastrophes in historical times. Did he prove the catastrophe that he particularly wanted to prove? I don't think so. I don't think his evidence is good enough. But I think there's some chance, there's a considerable probability that ha there were certainly catastrophes before the human race appeared. What wiped out the dinosaurs? What created all those meteor craters? Why are Mars and the moon full of meteor craters? There have been cosmic catastrophes. I just don't think Velikovsky got all the details right. <clears throat> Once you stop thinking in terms of either or, if I, well, actually, nobody thinks in terms of either or until they get involved in a political argument or a theological argument. The people who know what's true who make up most of the human race. They, they, they not only know what's true, they know how to defeat everybody who's an agnostic or a zetetic or, an, uh, or recognizes some indeterminacy. They get you trapped in an either or game and pretty soon you find yourself agreeing to something you never agreed to before. The way to resist that is the first time they bring up an either or, stop them at that point and say, wait a minute, I can think of three other choices. And if you can't think of three other choices, buy all of my books right away. They'll always, they'll, <laughs> well, I think the last speaker didn't, was not shy about plugging books, so why should I be shy about it? There are always more than one explanation. Once you've got five explanations, then you can start estimating the probabilities on each one of them. Like, for instance, um, I just read a book called The Professor and the Madman. Anybody here, I might as well get some audience reaction. Anybody here ever read The Professor and the Madman? Nobody? 
Oh, there's somebody you did. Good, good, good. Uh, the Professor and the Madman, the subtitle is a tale of murder and sanity in the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary was done by a team of scholars, I forget how many. One of the ones who contributed the most to it never appeared at meetings. He just sent his contributions in from the place where he lived, and they were so scholarly, so accurate, so carefully researched that he became one of the three or four major contributors to the Oxford English Dictionary, but he never came to meetings. Finally, the editor-in-chief of the Oxford English Dictionary went to meet him at his address. It turned out to be a madhouse. He was in there because he had suffered for years from the delusions that he was being persecuted by the Irish. The Irish crawl through the crawl space between the ceiling and the next floor. In 19th century architecture, there always was a crawl space. Nowadays, we've got a lot of houses without any crawl space. But in those days, they had crawl spaces. The Irish used to break in through the wall, crawl through the crawl space, knock a hole in the roof, get into his house, and for, uh, were bringing whores with them and force him to commit what he called all sorts of lewd and unspeakable sex acts with these prostitutes. Then they'd go away in the morning. Well, this was a bit of a nuisance, and he was a very puritanical guy who hated this kind of thing. So eventually, one morning after the Irish were through with him, he saw one of them leaving. He charged out in the street and shot one of the Irishmen who was persecuting him with all these sexual horrors. It turned out the Irishman was an Englishman, not an Irishman. He hadn't been in the crawl space. He was just on his way to work. When the police examined him, they turned him over to psychiatrists who discovered his delusions about the Irish persecuting him. And they put him in Broadmoor. But because he was a doctor, an MD, and a had served in the American Civil War, had an officer's rank and a pension. He got two rooms instead of one, especially since he was nonviolent as long as there weren't any Irishmen around. He got two rooms, and with his pension, he bought one of the best libraries in England, and that's how he did all the research for the Oxford English Dictionary. Towards the end of his life, his family back in the United States, through constant hounding of the English Foreign Office and the Home Secretary and the American State Department, so and they finally got permission to have him transferred out of Broadmoor to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., where he was put in the Cherry Ward, which is where they keep the less dangerous cases, which strikes me as a fantastic coincidence because later on they put Ezra Pound in the Cherry Ward of, of uh, St. Elizabeth's. Ezra had the same ideas about the Jews that Dr. Minor had about the Irish, and they both ended up in the cherry wood where they both did some of their most creative work. It just goes to show you can be crazy in some ways and a brilliant scholar and a great poet in Pound's case in other ways. Anyway, after 1904, Dr. Minor, that's the name of the man I've been talking about, the guy who thought the Irish were forcing him to commit unnatural sex acts with prostitutes, uh, before he was moved, even before he was moved to St. Elizabeth's, he was very interested in science as well as lexicography and word history. As soon as the Wright brothers got their first plane off the ground, his reality tunnel or grid or whatever you want to call it, his view of the world changed. The Irish weren't coming in through the ceiling anymore. They would fly their planes right next to Broadmoor whoosh him out through the window and fly him to Cairo where he had to do these lewd and unspeakable sex acts with Arab prostitutes who are even worse than European prostitutes in his view. But the Irish were still behind it, you see, even if they needed the assistance of Arab prostitutes. I, I read this book and I thought, Jesus, he was ahead of his time. If he said it was a UFO instead of an airplane, he'd get in one of Dr. Mack's books probably. <laughs> Now, how do I, I classify that in the maybe category, too? I don't know what the hell is going on in the case. I don't know what the hell's going on with me most of the time. The trouble with either of our logic is you end up with problems. Well, there are, there are a thousand problems with it, but one of them is 
if you put a cat in a box with a poison gas pellet, and the poison gas pellet is so designed that will it, it will explode at the end of a quantum decay process in some kind of radioactive material, you can calculate by the Schrodinger wave equations uh, what happens at any given time, T, you put in any time you want, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, 3 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever time you want. You solve the equation, and because of the nature of the wave equations in quantum mechanics, you get two answers. In one answer, the radioactive decay has reached the point where the poison gas pellet has exploded and the cat is dead. The other answer, it hasn't exploded yet. The poison gas pellet is still there and the cat is still alive. This seems to suggest that in the same space, but in different timelines, the cat lives in one and dies in the other. And a lot of physicists, well, yeah, especially among the younger physicists. I wrote a novel on this theme once. It was called Schrodinger's Cat. And I was amazed on my next lecture tour to find out how many young physicists told me they agreed with that model. I thought that was the weirdest of all the eight different explanations of the weirdity of quantum mechanics. But it seems a lot of the younger physicists especially, the more acid they've done, the more likely they are to accept that one. And the, the argument for accepting that one is that it accepts the equations at face value. All the other interpretations of quantum mechanics have to introduce metaphysical and philosophical and all sorts of extraneous ideas to explain it away. This just accepts the equation, gives you two answers, so there are two answers. Every time I toss a coin, it comes down heads and tails in different universes, except for the third universe where it comes down landing on its side and Ralph Nader won the election. Well, if you don't like a cat who's dead in one universe and alive in another universe, you've got to accept von Neumann's maybe state. The cat is in a maybe state until we open the door and look into the box. Then the, the state vector collapses and the cat sees the dead or alive. Now, what's the magic in opening a box? How can the cat be in a maybe state until we open the box and then suddenly collapse into a dead state or a live state? Nobody in quantum mechanics has a reason, and nobody in quantum mechanics agrees with anybody else in quantum mechanics. There are eight major models, and when you examine any of the major models, you find that people who hold that model disagree with each other on the technical details. There's even a quantum physicist at Columbia University named Berman, who has decided he believes in solipsism. He has written an article called, Is the Moon There When Nobody Is Looking? Which was in Physics Today a couple of years ago. And he argued the moon is not there when nobody is looking. Because if you assume the moon is there when nobody is looking, then you've got to assume the cat is there when nobody is looking. And if the cat is there, the cat's either dead or alive or in between. But the cat is not in a determinate state until you open the door. How can opening the door change the whole universe? That's like Einstein's famous question. If uh, or the, uh, the Copenhagen interpretation of Niels Bohr holds, you can't, inter you can't separate the observer from the observed. Ergo, whatever the observer is thinking is influencing the observed. So Einstein said, every time a mouse looks out of its mouse hole, the whole universe changes? Well, Niels Bohr said, yes, the whole universe does change, but a mouse has such a tiny brain that the universe changes infinitesimally and we don't notice it. On the other hand, John Archibald Wheeler, who, like Bohr was a no and Einstein was a Nobel Prize winner, John Archibald Wheeler said it's not a mouse. A mouse, of course, can't do it. But every time we conduct an experiment on the subatomic level, that changes the whole universe. And due to Bell's theorem, which says that any non-local hidden variable that explains quantum indeterminacy acts outside of space and time, that is to say there's no change no matter how far apart the so-called particles are that we're measuring. Of course, they're not really particles. They act like particles some of the time, and they act like waves some of the time, and part of the time they act like maybe they're particles and maybe they're waves. They're in the maybe state. Uh, John Archibald Wheeler is saying since 
Bell's theorem indicates there is no change in the hidden variables in space or time. Every time we conduct an experiment on the atomic level, every, every particle or wave or, or wave or whatever the hell they are in the whole universe, they all adjust to our new measurement all the way back to the Big Bang. So we are fine-tuning the universe every time we conduct an atomic experiment. And the question that has been debated forever, did the universe happen by accident or did it happen by design, has two answers. It happened partly by accident and partly by design, but it was all done by atomic physicists doing experiments. But how the fuck did they get here if there was no universe in the first place? Well, they created the universe which created them and then they were able to create the universe which created them. And John Archibald Wheeler is not in a nut house. He's at the University of Texas. He's honored and deep. Well, it's no crazier than Berman's idea that the universe doesn't exist until we look at it, which, as a matter of fact, was originally suggested by an Irishman named Bishop Barclay. Barclay wrote an enormous refutation of Newton in which he proved the universe doesn't exist. God just has a persistent hallucination that it exists. And Barclay did not suggest psychotherapy for God, probably because he couldn't think of anybody with the skills to handle the job. But. Now, all of this may sound rather abstract, scientific, and technical. But as a matter of fact, you've all had this experience, I'm sure. You're walking down the street, <clears throat> and you see a friend you haven't seen in five years, ten years, or some time, right across the street coming towards you. What the hell is Joe doing in this town? I thought he had moved to Chicago. As you get closer, it turns out to be somebody else. He was in the maybe state until he got close enough to be recognized, but because we're all in the habit of trusting our nervous system more than it deserves to be trusted, we think we saw Joe. This happens all the time. When I do a whole workshop, instead of just a short talk, I have people describe the hall outside the workshop room. No two people ever describe it the same. Everybody's nervous system abstracts different from the hund, I'll do my Carl Sagan bit now, from the billions and billions of photons and neutrons and positrons and whatnot floating around in the nervous system picks up a certain amount and we organize them in our brains and project them outward as a hologram and we call that reality. It's all guesswork. If you take three buckets, one very warm, one very cold, and one lukewarm, and you put one finger at one hand in the hot one and one hand in the cold one, wait a while, then put them both in the middle one, which is lukewarm, It'll feel cold to the hand that's been in the hot water and hot to the hand that's been in the cold water. That was known in ancient Greece. Everything in modern neuropsychology tends to confirm that. We can't trust our nervous systems. It tells us what we expect to hear. Now, if you followed me up to this point, you have reached enlightenment in some sense because you probably by this point know the answer to one of the great basic koans of Zen Buddhism. Who is the great magician who makes the grass green? Anybody have any doubts? <clears throat> okay, we all know the master who makes the grass green, but the thing is, can you remember it the next time you get into an argument? <laughs> you can't speak with... In, you know, there's an old rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Bullshit! <laughs> I swear to God, you can be beaten up by a professional from the mafia, and you will be better, healthier, and cured quicker than if somebody really says something nasty to you that really sinks in. If your mother or your father or somebody says, you just never change, you never learn anything, you're going to be the same, you will go on being the same forever and never changing and never learning. Every time you speak to somebody else, you're either giving them a blessing or a cursing. Every time you get angry, you're giving them a cursing. Every time you make love, you give them a blessing, at least I hope so. 
You should. Well, if you're making love by definition, you're giving them a blessing. <clears throat> but pe words have much stronger effects than we realize. And if we're thinking in either or terms, we're going around dividing the world up in a totally artificial way. As for instance, in Ireland, in County Cork, in the city hall, there are four clocks facing the four quarters, and they never agree with each other. They're called the four liars. When we lived in Dublin, my wife and I used to, every time we could see two clocks from the same place, we'd compare them, and they always disagreed. This is because the Irish tend to believe that time was invented by the English to make a man work more than is altogether good for him, <laughs> or more than the good Lord ever intended. The, uh, I, had an, I had another Irish joke, but I forget it, so I'll move onward quickly. The, 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 this is what Einstein called excite, subjective time. We all have our own subjective time. And no two of us have the same time, just like we don't hear the same sounds. The master who makes the grass green, the puka, the holy guardian angel, the entelechy, the extraterrestrials, the fairies, the wh whoever it is that is secretly controlling what we think of as our independent ego, gives us our own sounds, our own time. We're all living in entirely different universes. It's a f bloody, incredible miracle that we could communicate at all <laughs> under the sun. And yet we can to the miracle of language, although usually we misunderstand each other more than we should. That's another reason why the universe contains a maybe. All of our ideas are based on our perceptions and our perceptions are all uncertain. If, you can't, if our perceptions have a degree of uncertainty in them, and I only gave you one demonstration on a two-day workshop, I give a dozen or more. If, you can't, if your perceptions are a little bit uncertain, all your inferences from your perceptions are uncertain. So you've got to have a maybe in your universe. And what happens with a maybe? That doesn't mean you can't make decisions. The idea you can't make decisions without certitude is based on the old Aristotelian true-false fallacy. Once you get beyond the true-false fallacy, you're not adrift in nihilism. You've got probabilities. And that's how most businesses make their decision. They used to do it on hunches. Now they do it with computers calculating the probabilities. Quantum physics gets along very well with probabilities. Absolutes just do not exist, at least not in this vicinity of space-time. An English woman once asked a Zen master, what is perfect peace? And he said, two drunks fighting in an alley. This seems totally inscrutable to people who've been raised in an Aristotelian culture, because we think in absolutes. We think absolute peace means not, nobody's doing any harm to anybody else. The Buddhists know we're living in a relative universe. If you're living in a world or a town where two drunks fighting in an alley is the worst violence going on, you've got as close to absolute peace as we'll ever see. The belief in absolute peace, like the belief in absolute truth, is one of those medieval superstitions we've got to put on the back shelf and forget all about. Meanwhile, never forget that the day I contacted the extraterrestrials from Sirius, Monica Lewinsky was born. That must mean something. Every synchronicity means something. I'm still working on that one, whatever. And if I ever figure it out, I, I'll come back to the next Prophets Conference and explain it. And thank you for your attention.